Hey there guys, Alex for Mental Health Thinking here. The video this week is on parenting. I'm just going to talk about what I think are the two pillars, at least according to the research, and what I always look for with people when it comes to good parenting practices. So the pillars are simply attachment and boundary setting. These areas are relatively easy to understand, but they're not so easy to put into practice, especially on a day-to-day -day basis when things are getting difficult, maybe you haven't had enough sleep, maybe you've got your own problems and you're stressed with work. It is difficult to be persistent with these, but it's really important to be. In order to encourage what's called secure attachment, as opposed to the various different sorts of insecure attachments, what you need to be is consistently there, but not helicoptering around to give them the impression that they can't handle it themselves. Parents can fall down on this area of attachment in several different sorts of ways. So one is if they're caught up with their own problems, so they're not paying attention to their child all the time. Maybe they're just paying attention every now and then. Then the child doesn't get the sense that they can always rely on them because sometimes they're busy, sometimes they're just not there. An attachment, although simple, can actually be quite difficult to achieve when you do have your own problems because we don't stop having our own individual problems the minute we have children. We continue having them down the line and then we have the responsibility to be there for not only one child but sometimes many and they all have that same requirement of having an attachment figure in their life. In the same vein, a lot of times people will give attention to their children as a reward. So the child gets the impression that in order to actually be good enough to get their parents' attention and approval, they actually need to be achieving. And it leads to some problems down the line in a lot of cases. So the other section is on consistent boundaries. Children have a more simple view of the world than adults do. And it means giving them firm agreements, giving them firm ideas of what sorts of behaviors will lead to reward and what sorts of behaviors you want to see and don't want to see and what sorts of things are against the rules, so to speak. That's actually really important. And in the same vein, children actually do really like a certain degree of structure. This helps them feel secure and cared for and gives them predictability about the world and what they expect to see. The consistent boundaries one is quite a difficult one for people because let's say we don't want them to fight with their brother or sister. Well, to have consistent boundaries, it would be to set a rule and to always stick with that no matter the situation. But what if you're busy at the time and you just want to kind of let it slide at some stage? Or what if they really get under your skin at some stage because maybe you're irritated about something else, maybe for whatever reason it's just more annoying to you at that time, maybe you're in a rush. The rules that they understand and that you've agreed to need to stay the same no matter what. Now I'm sure there's a lot of people who are watching this just saying, well, you know, it's all well and good saying all this stuff, you know, you can have consistent rules up the wazoo, but how do you get them to actually do it? How do you get them to do the things that you want so that you're not frustrated all the time? Well, it's one of those things again that's simple but really difficult sometimes. On a basic standpoint, there's a couple of different forms of conditioning. So if you want a certain behavior to happen, then you can either give them something good when they do it or take away something bad. So these are called reinforcement. Punishment would be if there's a behavior that's going on that you don't want, then you can take away something good. It might be the toy they're playing with or something like that. It might be dessert. Or you can give them something bad. First, we need to understand that if you were to use reinforcement or punishment only, reinforcement, according to the research, is far more effective. So that is to actually not punish at all and to just reinforce. Now you might think, well, that wouldn't work. The reinforcement tells me how to encourage good behavior, but it doesn't tell me how to discourage bad behavior. Well, what you can do is 
really think it through and come up with good behaviors that are mutually exclusive with the bad behavior. So let's say that child is having a tantrum. So that's a behavior that you don't want to see. So what you can do is encourage the behavior of them being calm. And in fact, you can encourage stages of that where it might sound a little counterproductive, but if they normally have a tantrum where they're running around, they're kicking and they're screaming, and maybe they, they pull their sibling's hair, if they were to have a lesser tantrum on one occasion, then you could actually encourage that. So you're rewarding, even though they're still doing something that you see is bad from that point of view, from that absolute point of view, relative to their normal situation where they're actually running around kicking, screaming, pulling hair. If they didn't pull hair, if they, let's say, just raised their voice and ran around, but they weren't actually physically aggressive, you could reward that, make it clear that you're rewarding that because it's great that they're doing less, right? Now, it can be really hard to get your head around in the first place, rewarding things that you don't wanna see. But think of it in this way, compared with the normal behavior, you are absolutely rewarding what you wanna see. You're seeing a reduction in the poor behavior that you don't want. It's really important to be watching all the time and to reward those little things. Now, this really could form all of what you do. And there's actually a lot of really useful, good, systems out there like parent management therapy that you can learn from psychologists that are all about just using reinforcement because as i said reinforcement versus punishment reinforcement is much more effective and punishment also has some real pitfalls in that it can damage the relationship between you and your child because they can start to see you as the scary one and in fact, when you use only reinforcement, they will do the good behavior even when you're not there. They get used to that good feeling, they'll do it anyway. But when you use punishment, what happens is that they might be well behaved when you're there. It's a sense of fear. But when you're not there, they will actually continue to be poorly behaved. And that can be really frustrating. You might think, you know, why does he keep on defying me? Why does he keep on doing what I've told him not to do? Or he, you know, tries to sneak around and do it when I'm not looking. Well, that's often a result of using punishment because it does actually result in them wanting to do it anyway, but just finding ways when they can avoid the punishment. Now, sometimes you may very well use punishment, but you need to be really specific about what you're actually doing. Now one, you really want to be clear on the agreement of this. So you could say, okay, whenever you're eating a meal, you sit at the table and you start throwing food around the place. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take you to your bedroom and you're going to be there away from everyone for five minutes. And then I'm going to come and get you and you're gonna come back to the table. And if it happens again, I'll just keep on doing that same thing. So that's the agreement, so they understand, and you keep on reinforcing that every time you do it. It's a punishment because you're taking away the stimulation of having everyone around and the opportunity to eat and all that sort of thing. So you're taking away something good to try to decrease a behavior. With punishment, it's really important to stick to that contract yourself. So you can't take them away from the table if you just think that they're going to start throwing food around. Or maybe if they did something else but it wasn't part of the agreement because that causes confusion and unpredictability and it needs to be something that they can really understand. You also can't give them more of a punishment when you happen to be feeling angry or irritated yourself. So that idea of, right, get out, no dinner then that's a bigger punishment than is part of the contract. And that comes from a point of your anger and your difficulty coping with the situation, which by the way is understandable that you would have difficulty coping with the situation. But 
it's really ineffective to do that because what it really does, apart from creating an unpredictable situation for them, is make you seem like you're the scary person who really needs to be avoided or gotten away from, rather than them attributing it to the behavior that, oh, okay, I threw the food again, I went, I went to my room, I had to do that. There are those little things that we do that we don't even recognize in ourselves that are actually taken as punishment for kids. A change in face expression. Maybe our voice gets deeper because we're angry or we raise our voice a little bit. Whatever we do when we happen to be angry, that is taken as punishment. And unless that's a specific part of what you've agreed to, to be the consequence of a certain action, then that really can't be a part of it. And it does mean really being in control of yourself and to not show that anger when it's not going to be due and it's not going to be useful. You've got to understand that punishment isn't something you're doing to make yourself feel better. You don't yell because you're angry and then you take it out on the kid and then think, oh, well, they deserved that or they needed that because it makes them better. That sort of inconsistent, unpredictable punishment actually does not improve the situation. There really is no excuse that you can truthfully give yourself for doing that sort of thing. You've got to be really, really aware of yourself and think, okay, is this part of the agreement? Am I actually contributing to making the situation better or am I just trying to make myself feel better? Okay, guys, that's my video on parent management. When it just comes to those real fundamental pillars, I hope you've enjoyed it. I hope you've gotten something out of it. And I also hope that I didn't tread on too many shoes. I wasn't trying to talk about any particular way that you must do things about different parenting styles and whatnot. There's plenty of different ways to do it. I just wanted to talk about those really important things that are across the board. Okay, thanks.